Welcome to season three of Sweet Valley Diaries, the podcast where sometimes the conniving bratty evil twin is the most sympathetic character. Book number 21, Runaway. Jessica's had enough. So does that make me Miss America? Hi, welcome to Sweet Valley Diaries. I am your host, Marissa Flaxbart, and with me today, I am very happy to introduce Jocelyn Schofield. Hello, hello. I'm happy to be here. Jocelyn, you are already a very important part of this podcast. In fact, I say your name uh, pretty much every episode to thank you for the use of your beautiful song, Beautiful Boys. So your voice has been featured uh, pretty much you know, every episode of the podcast thus far, but this one will feature your voice considerably more. I right. hope. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, for listeners, since this is the beginning of a new season, if you are new to Sweet Valley Diaries, the podcast, um, first of all, welcome aboard. Uh, what we do here is we talk about Sweet Valley High novels, but probably if you found your way to this podcast, you knew that already. You're welcome to like jump aboard here if you want. Like You'll probably figure it out uh, as we go. But may I recommend that you go back to the beginning? We're talking about a serialized set of books from the 1980s. We are still 21 books in, like deep in the 80s. We're going to be in the 80s for a while. The series continues and continues on into the 90s. The, these books take place in the fictional town of Sweet Valley, California. Um, I think that Sweet Valley is in Orange County. Um, if you want to know my reasoning for that, uh, you can listen to the episode for a book called Perfect Summer, where everybody takes a really long bike ride up the coast. The book focuses mostly on characters that are juniors at Sweet Valley High, the titular high of the Sweet Valley High series. And our main focus is a set of twins named Jessica and Elizabeth Wakefield, who we know from series creator Francine Pascal are intended to be really like a good twin and evil twin, like the ego and the id. But honestly, it is a lot more complicated than that. I'm happy to say it's not really quite that black and white. But without further ado, Jocelyn, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I am happy to be here. Have you ever taken a bike ride up the coast, like all from Orange County to like Big Sur? I have, uh, I love to bike and I usually bike from Santa Monica down to like Manhattan Beach. So, um, yeah, I Manhattan the, Beach could be Sweet Valley. Yeah, 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 it definitely could. Yeah, so there's there's that bike path that goes straight down the ocean, and uh -huh. it's like, I think it might be like 13 miles. So basically, you're just like living the Sweet Valley high life. Yeah, I'm basically still in high school, <laughs> and uh, I'm sure as you were reading this book, you were like, oh wow, this is exactly like my life. Every oh, absolutely, day. and in my my life in high school, it was exactly like this. <laughs> Listeners, I don't want to steer you wrong. There's zero bike riding in this book. Uh, <laughs> there could be bike riding, but instead there is just crazy car driving and sane car driving, and then there's a bus. But we'll get there. Um, I want to start by asking you, Jocelyn, if you have a history with these books, if you had read the books at all before this one. Uh, yeah, I remember reading um, these books in, I think, in middle school. And uh, I lived in South Carolina. I think I think they were cool. I don't know if anybody else read them. I'm assuming if if I read them, my friends read them. But yeah, I remember reading them and like liking Jessica Wakefield because she was like cool. Mm -hmm. um, and then as an adult reading this book and thinking like she's a terrible, terrible role model. <laughs> She's a terrible, terrible role model could be a good slogan for like a t-shirt about this series. Yeah, absolutely. And it could be applied to almost anybody in the books, I think. Yeah. But um, uh, we'll get into that. I mean, speaking of Jessica, maybe we should talk about the cover. Oh, uh, yes. Like describe the cover. Listeners, um, I'll post a picture of the cover as always on our Instagram page. Um, it's at Sweet Valley Diaries appropriately on Instagram. But let's talk about this cover. I kind of love it. Okay. <laughs> uh, so it's it has uh i think like it, the sweet valley high is in uh, it's like a varsity jacket yeah like a, a varsity yeah, exactly yeah. and there's a little flag that says that has a 21 on it yeah um which i think is maybe like a cheerleading flag or something because yeah, it's, like it's a pennant you know like yeah, yay exactly. high school yeah um and then she's in the middle she's got a um 
She being Jessica Wakefield. Jessica, yes. Who is the main character of this book, Runaway. Listeners, most of you probably listened to episode 20, we we teased at the end that Jessica was having a hard time. Everybody was giving her a hard time about how she poisoned them once with uh, clams that weren't opened. That This comes up in, in this book, too. But oh, yeah. Anyway, Jessica was in a bad mood. And then we found out the book was called Runaway, so it was not really a huge surprise uh, what's going to happen <laughs> to this book. Like, So Jessica is on this cover, mm. and she's got... Um, she's looking back over her shoulder dramatically, and she has a very sullen look on her face, uncharacteristic for Jessica. Yeah, and she's got a um, the sweatshirt she's wearing has I don't know if you remember those sweatshirts from like Flashdance where they're cut the neck is cut out you know and you have like a tank top underneath or something or bra underneath, but the the sweatshirt is like has raw edges and yeah. it's sort of like. You know, a little bit drapey around the shoulders. It's perfect that you said flash dance because I was thinking that she looks like, because the title's Runaway, she's got this duffel bag over her shoulder, she's wearing this sweatshirt. And I mean, it looks like she was running away from like Flash Dance Academy. Like, that's <laughs> definitely what I was thinking of the, the vibe this is giving off. Yeah. I, I, was, I guess I was describing her as sullen, but she also just looks a little pissed off. Like, take that, everyone. Which we know is kind of you're her gonna attitude. You're going to feel sorry later. Yeah, you're going to miss me when I'm gone. It's yeah. basically Jessica's MO here. So, yeah. um, well, let's get in and we'll talk about the book. Uh, it starts and they're on a break. Uh, they have a week off of school. And so that's actually significant because for once, the fact that nobody goes to school is, it makes sense. It's okay. This Simpler Wines from Trader Joe's is not very good. <laughs> yeah, we're drinking cans of Simpler Wines Rosé. And you know what? I'm just happy to be drinking Rosé with you out of a can. In the afternoon. In the like, afternoon, that's yeah. Great. It doesn't have to be great. <laughs> and it's not. <laughs> well, now we know. Now we know. And, you know, after this, we have two more cans waiting for us. Absolutely. So. I have some orange juice. We'll cut it with some orange Ooh, juice. Ooh, very, very nice. So it's spring break, and the, like the first thing we find out basically is that Stephen Wakefield is home. Yes, from school. How did this strike you coming in? I thought uh, again. I haven't. I don't remember like the last book I read when I was a kid, but I thought that it was very serious right away. Like his girlfriend died, and yes. I'm like, this is very intense, and the twins. We're just like, man, he's so sad. Like, oh, he's been sad for months now, or a month, or I don't know. Jessica how long. says something that's basically like, he needs to get over it. Seriously, like, gosh, everybody. Do-. She didn't say that, but I was just like, oh, that's not very sensitive. And it seems like if you knew her, like, shouldn't maybe you be sad too? Yeah. Instead, the book <laughs> alludes to the fact that Jessica feels a little guilty that she was such a bitch about Trisha, the deceased girlfriend, when mm-hmm. Trisha was alive, because Trisha's from a trashy family. But yeah, mm-hmm. we're getting to a point. I mean, this book is a kind of a somber book anyway, but I mean, in the like pantheon of Sweet Valley, the books, the the subject matter and the tone is a little bit sad, but it's getting to a, a point where the like passing references to things that have happened in their past are getting out of control. There's a reference to Elizabeth's coma. Oh, right. <laughs> There's a reference to Atricia's death, of course. There's a reference to Caroline Pierce, who used to be a gossip, but now she's reformed. Yeah, and wasn't there, like, a couple that... Um... Ricky Capaldo and Annie Whitman. Oh, yeah. I was like, these kids have been through a lot of stuff to be still so immature. Right. <laughs> Ricky Capaldo, we'll get to in a moment, but he factors very largely into the B story of this book. And it just, in passing, references how he helped Annie Whitman through her suicide attempt. And it's like, ah! Yeah. It's like a lot of serious stuff. Yeah, yeah. So because the model of this podcast is that I have a new guest on pretty much every week, and oftentimes, you know, more often than not, they don't remember what happened in these books or have not read any of the Sweet Valley books ever before, uh, you definitely notice how those, like, passing references are a little bit chilling. But I think that what's happening with Elizabeth and Jessica sort of casually being like, oh, Stephen's so sad. Like, they think he's going to, he basically says he's going to quit college for the semester at least. He needs to to get over Trisha's death, which is not unreasonable. Like, your girlfriend, your 18-year-old girlfriend just died of leukemia. You want to take the rest of the semester off? That seems okay to me. Yeah. (laughs) But. You want to be sad for a little bit and not go to parties? 
it's fine. Yeah, yeah. I think that what's happening is the the book's own inner struggle with like how do we address the fact that there is this trauma in a universe where as we often say on the podcast, trauma doesn't really exist. Like there's not a lot of lasting effects of the shit that happens. Uh, So it's awkward. But speaking of parties, that's like actually a big impetus for the whole book is that Kara Walker is having a party. Mm -hmm. Jessica had set Kara and Steven up on a bad date when Trisha was sick. And so Elizabeth thinks that Jessica should invite Steven to Kara's party, just not not to fix them up but just because it would be something to distract Stephen. And Jessica's like, Elizabeth, if I say that to Stephen, he's going to think that I'm trying to set them up and he's going to be mad. And Elizabeth's, no, 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 right? She goes and talks to Stephen and says very casually around the dinner table, like, maybe you should come to this party. And Stephen just like jumps on her. Yeah, yeah. And I, she did it in a way, I think, that um, that was sort of I think she was trying to be cheeky like oh I have nobody to go with and the references are like oh, how could Jessica not have any she has so many boyfriends how could she never have anybody to to go to a party with so I think Stephen like saw through that yeah yeah I guess this is the first one of, of a recurring theme in this book which is Elizabeth tells people to do things and then when they do the things that she recommends they do, it, like, blows up in their face. Oh, really? I mean, it's not ever Elizabeth's fault. I don't think that that happens. But in this case, you know, Stephen gets mad uh, when Elizabeth basically told Jessica to invite him. But Jessica, uh, you know, she's really hurt. She's not just angry, but she goes to this place that I'm honestly surprised it took so long for her to get there, where she's like damn it, you know, this was Elizabeth's idea. I said it wouldn't work. And as soon as Elizabeth starts to explain it away, like, oh, no, it was my idea. Everybody's like, oh, okay, Mm. Liz, we understand. And rather than feeling like, phew, you know, thank God Elizabeth bore the brunt of it, she just notices the difference between the way they react to the two and is like, Everybody thinks Elizabeth is so great. (laughs) Well, since I haven't or don't remember the previous books, like, is Elizabeth that great? Is she sort of a good person? She's kind of the greatest. And (laughs) there's a line I laughed at. I had to laugh. And um, I I just posted this on Instagram, actually. Like, maybe I should get a tattoo of this quote, uh, like, uh, across my chest or something. It says, Jessica is thinking angrily to herself. Elizabeth Wakefield, savior of the world, defender of the oppressed, strikes again. (laughs) This is when they're at the party. Eventually, Stephen gives in and goes to the party. But Jessica is, she's already pissed. Like, she doesn't care that, like, the plan worked because it's, like, she's bitter about the fact that Stephen jumped down her throat. And the Wakefields love Elizabeth more than they love her. I mean, we could talk about the fact that Jessica, like, has earned this reputation. Right. And that she, there's one point, uh later in the book where she's trying to make amends and prove to her family that she's changed or that she will change. And she says something, I I forget what it was, but she says something and she's like, no, that'll take too long. I'll just make dinner. (laughs) It's like the idea of changing would take like a day. Maybe it was like clean a room or something. It was like, oh, it'd take like a day to clean a room. But she's like, no, I'm going to do something faster to show them that I've changed. Yeah. I'm going to make dinner tonight. That's what it was. She thought, so <laughs> Jessica has this famously messy room. I think it's described in this book as it would, uh, it should be like a nuclear waste site or it looks like a nuclear waste site. There's a lot of talk about how amazing it is that she can find anything in there, except she always can. There's a funny line at some point where she grabs her lipstick and it was, she's like, it's from Jessica's perspective. And it says her lipstick was like right under the magazines and her sweater right where she'd left it. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was like, kind of sweet because I, I can I can relate to that. A I little can bit. definitely relate to that. Yeah, she that's what it is. She thinks that she if she just cleans her room, then they'll know that she's really turned to leave. Now, this is at, this is after some yo-yoing on Jessica's part because she's angry. She feels misunderstood. And honestly, her family is not doing a great job of like, listening to her complaints. That's fair. I also think, like, there must be some baggage there that they don't take her seriously. Like, she does seem a bit shallow in general as a person. Um, well, she's also taking everything personally. This yeah. is this is actually a, this is a good lesson, I think, for teenagers, if they can see through to, to that level, that 
her hurt feelings are probably very relatable, like not feeling valued by your family mm-hmm. or whatever. But she hears everything that everybody in her family says to her as like a personal slight. Yeah, that is true. We can get into that more like toward the end of the book. But, you know, people, this is one of the things where Elizabeth says something like Elizabeth tells somebody to do something and they do it and it backfires is that Elizabeth can sense that Jessica is really upset. Yeah. And she tells Stephen, like, you should apologize to her for snapping at her at the breakfast table. And when Stephen does, Jessica just is like, did Elizabeth tell you to say that? Mm. And Stephen's like, no. And Jessica is so, like, unwilling to hear what Stephen has, Stephen's apology, that he ends up being kind of a dick in the end anyway. And then she cries and, like, dives into the swimming pool. Like, her hot tears are staining her cheeks. <laughs> oh, yeah. Some of the references were, like, really funny. There was one that, um, I think she was upset or something, and she was taking the car, and it, she has, like a, uh, like, a Fiat. Yeah. And the reference or the analogy was like her heart was racing as fast as her Fiat was like, as the engine was like driving or revving. And I was like, that is a very interesting. (laughs) That sounds like some, you found something that I did not find this week, which is a forced (laughs) metaphor. metaphor. Yes. It's a whole segment. And there was another one talking about the nuclear, Jessica's uh, room and the nuclear waste site. And Elizabeth said something like, Spoiler alert. Uh, at the end, when her room is clean and Elizabeth sees that her room is clean, she's like, I thought the EPA had come in and done. And I was like, what high schooler is talking about the Environmental Protection Agency? Like, <laughs> Well, I guess the same high schooler who gets permission from the local newspaper to write a story about a trial that's that ongoing so in the community. Weird. That was so weird. Um, so I guess for let's let's get into that okay. um, since it came up naturally. We'll put a pause in saying that Jessica feels really resentful of her family and um, they are not doing a great job. Uh, actually, let me just say that every once in a while in these books, we get an example of Ned and Alex, Ned and Alice Wakefield. I can't, ooh, the rosé is kicking in. <laughs> Ned, Ned and Alice Wakefield just being terrible parents. And there is an example of that. Oh, really? I thought so. Well, I thought so. It's when Elizabeth first brings up to Ned and Alice that, and Stephen, that she thinks something's seriously wrong with Jessica at this point, and they need to take her moods a little more seriously than they usually do. Elizabeth, being Jessica's twin, Mm -hmm. like, has a sort of a sixth sense about this. Not to mention she's good at figuring out what's going on with other people most of the time anyway. And Elizabeth seems very sensitive. She seems, she, the whole family seems busy with this case. That, is that what you're talking about? Or is yeah. that where we're going? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So she's, um, Elizabeth is weirdly writing this story and her dad is defending the the side of the grandparents. Well, let's get into it and then I'll go back and explain this okay. bad parenting example. Okay. So you mentioned Annie Whitman and Ricky Capaldo. Yes. So... Ricky Capaldo's parents got divorced, and yes. everybody at school is talking about it. Or the yeah yeah yeah, and now his mom is preventing his paternal grandparents from seeing him or his sister. Right, and it's there's a whole court case about it because like I guess legally the mom has the right to refuse them visitation, but the grandparents uh, really want to see the kids. So yeah, there's a whole court case about it, and they discuss it. The Wakefields, Ned Wakefield, is a lawyer. Mariana West from book one makes a reappearance, listeners, in uh, this book. Now she's a full-fledged partner. All right. She used to be Ned's assistant. Ah. So uh, Ned is covering the case, and they're talking about it around the dinner table, which, I don't know, that seems a little weird, but uh, the whole family is going to go, like, support him at the trial, and Elizabeth is really interested in the trial, so she's gotten permission from the town paper to Write a story it about the, it. Is, is it the town paper or, like, the school paper? I thought it was... She writes for the school paper, uh-huh. like, all the time. But I kind of... I got it from the book that she was... That this article was for the town paper. Mm. Either way, it's weird. It is Cause weird. Because it would be really, really kind of fucked up for the school newspaper to have a story about one of the students. Well, did you... Did you... There was one line in the book that was talking about... I think it was talking about the school newspaper, how the the it covers things like who's dating who. That's and, and yeah, that's Elizabeth's se- segment. It's called Eyes and Ears for the Oracle. So she writes about gossip, which is like really bizarre to me. Like 
my high school definitely wouldn't have allowed people to write about it's like what, what's like okay magazine or something like no that's not real journalism i feel yeah. like school newspapers yeah. are like pretending to be real journalism yeah I not guess, like smut magazines i guess in that uh through that lens it's really no weirder for there to be a whole like expose or a whole story about a student's a legal battle with his between his mother and his grandparents then there would then it is weird to have gossip stories about they're, they're sort of coded but everybody knows who they're about uh in the paper about who's dating whom and who was spotted where with that's so weird yeah. to me it, it is, it's it's weird yeah it says this was a big assignment the biggest the sweet valley newspaper had allowed her so far which I think they mean the sweet the town of Sweet Valley mm. as opposed to Sweet Valley High. Okay. But Ricky doesn't want Elizabeth to write this story. Mm. So Ricky confronts Elizabeth about that. And then there circle back there are repercussions with Jessica, which is what you were alluding to. Because when Jessica so after going through some ups and downs, decides that she's gonna show everybody that she's turned a new leaf by cooking dinner for them. They all start talking over the dinner about this trial. And Jessica tries to, like, throw in some opinions, but kind of gets, like, they're just like, yeah, yeah. And, well, as Elizabeth's opinions are really, like, tell me more. Her da- Their dad especially is like, oh, that's a great point, Elizabeth. Oh, yeah. You know, go on. Now, this is all par for the course for, like, any dinner at the Wakefields' house, except Jessica cooked it. But <laughs> Jessica is feeling it like, this is where she's taking everything personally because of this, like, mental state that she's in. She's hearing it as, like, Elizabeth's opinions are valid. Mine are unimportant. Mm. Uh, And I could see how she would feel that way. And she spent most of her dinner um, thoughts, let's say, while she's observing all this, just sort of, like, actually the whole book, just feeling sorry for herself. Like, woe is me. Nobody listens to me. Nobody respects my opinion. They're not they're not paying attention to me. They don't value me. They don't love me. It just it seemed a lot like a big old pity party <laughs> for, the, for the whole book. I will say though, I really feel for Jessica about this whole cooking thing. Uh, Jessica, you wouldn't know this from this book necessarily, but Jessica has in the past actually shown some aptitude for cooking. Oh. But her family has like never seen it because the one time she cooked them this fancy meal, she like served them like mussels that hadn't opened all the way and they got sick. And now every time she tries to cook for them or or suggest that she will, they're all like, oh, I'm going to, I better, you know, put a you deposit down on my oh, grave yeah. plot or something. And this time is no different. Yeah, yeah. She's done, gone out of her way. They know that she's in a bad mood. They know that she's been like depressed and she goes out of her way to cook them dinner. And then in addition to really laying on thick about how weird it is, and then the parents make a lot of jokes among themselves about what she wants, and it's actually yeah. even a little bit funny, except that you know how desperate things are for Jessica, so it's not that funny. But then, when they sit down to eat, I'll read this, this section here. Um, uh, they all sit down at the table, and just <laughs> Elizabeth asks, there isn't any seafood in anything. And, like, everybody laughs. And Jessica's just, like, feeling like shit. And um, it says, Alice Wakefield stifled her laughter. Come on, Liz, that isn't fair. Everything looks beautiful, Jess. Thank you, Jessica said coldly. Elizabeth handed her father the chicken. Here, Dad, you start. Perhaps I should check my will first, Ned Wakefield quipped. This is uh, encapsulates the mood of Jessica in the book. It was just a joke, but it cut through Jessica like a knife. She had spent all afternoon in the kitchen trying to make her family see that she had changed, and now they were making stupid jokes. Couldn't you see how much it hurt her? Everyone at the table ate hesitantly. Jessica sat silently and watched as each person tried a bit of this and a bit of that, as if afraid of being poisoned. (laughs) (laughs) So was the last time that they ate a meal that she cooked, were they poisoned? Or have there been several meals since then? I think it was the last time, but... At this point, that was, like, many books ago. <laughs> so, like, what, like a month ago in real time? Uh, no, that's anybody's guess, Jocelyn. <laughs> it really is. I have no idea. Uh, like, last week, 
you know, people were being kidnapped in the week before in comas, or I don't know. It's, <laughs> it's all... Really, it's really intense at Sweet Valley. Yeah, yeah, this is like the least of their problems, that maybe <laughs> right. they'll get food poisoning. <laughs> but let me, let me circle back yeah. to earlier in the book, when Elizabeth first brings up to Ned and Alice that she thinks that there is a problem, mm-hmm. and she tells them um, that Jessica's just not acting like herself, and... Alice says, I agree that Jess isn't herself these days, but I think it's a change for the better. She seems more in control to me. No complaints, no arguments. As a parent, I can definitely see how that would be more (laughs) beneficial. Let me go on. That's just what I mean, Elizabeth interrupted. It may be nice, but it just isn't Jessica. Oh, I'm sure it's just boy trouble, her father said. That's what it usually is. Yeah, or comas, or, like, suicide attempts, you know. So, the parents are both, like, whatever. She's fine. Shut up. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I would definitely have to, like, read the other books to to get a full spectrum of of Jessica. But she does say some things in the book that sort of make her seem maybe a little bit, like, self-centered, like at the, <laughs> like at the at one point she talks about like like jeans that she gave to her sister and that she wrote that make her look fat and she doesn't say here are some jeans I'd like you to have them. Yeah, she she's says, like these make me look fat. Here here you go. Yeah, she's showing her a few colors. So and like at the end Ned doesn't Ned offer to like have her cook another meal like give her money to cook another meal at the end of the book oh, yeah and she's like how about i just order pizza everybody and spend the rest of the money buying myself new clothes well i actually <laughs> think okay so let's go ahead we'll skip to the end um guys jessica runs away but she's caught at the last minute um we can we can tell it more dramatically shortly but like you guys knew right you knew i'm looking at the microphone like it's your face uh listener You knew, right, from the title of the book that Jessica ran away? The title is Runaway. (laughs) Yeah. So, uh, but at the end of the book, they, the the book alludes to the fact that the Wakefields all have a great conversation where everybody's feelings are all aired, and after the conversation, everybody feels better about the family than ever. And that's all, like, we don't get a soundbite of the Mm -hmm. conversation or anything. And then it's weirdly feels like business as usual. The dad makes this shitty comment about how, like, oh, maybe we'll try cooking again. Or she offers to cook. I think that's what happens is that that's what happens. She offers to cook again. They still can't drop it. They've never thanked her, by the way, for the meal that she made for them earlier. And we didn't talk about the fact that Jessica leaves the table at that meal and nobody says anything about the fact that she's left the room. Like she's made them dinner. We're seeing all this through Jessica's perspective. So that might be why I'm relating to her so much, but I usually really do not (laughs) as listeners can attest. Um, But she like leaves the room and then leaves the house without them saying anything. And like Elizabeth the next day is like, what was that disappearing act all about? It's like, bitch, please. Like you, (laughs) nobody said anything. Nobody was talking to her. Nobody was engaging with her. And you guys apparently didn't notice that she left. So yeah, that is weird. Like somebody gets up. I mean, it's not like there are 30 people at the table or like five. So at the end, I didn't, I didn't think it was sort of that, um, that shitty, like at the end when they have the reunion, um, Ned's like, I just realized that none of us had had dinner. And Jessica's like, well, listen, just to show you all how happy I am to be home, I'm going to cook a special dinner for us. The Wakefields, I'm assuming this is his parents, exchange worried glances. Oh, yeah, it is business as usual. Yeah. So- <laughs> I was like, he's like, why don't you just, why don't I give you money and you can take us out for dinner? Yeah, and Jessica's like, well, I mean, at least she, rather than being hurt by it, she turns it around. Uh, yeah. But it's like she turns it around in a way that's like playing into her old personality. That is so true. So she says, you know, it says, Jessica smiled slyly. I've got a better idea. Why don't you give me the money for a really special dinner and I'll buy us pizza instead? Then I can use what we saved and buy myself this terrific sweater I've been dying for. How does that sound? And then Ned Wakefield is like, ha, 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 that sounds wonderful. Just, just wonderful. <laughs> and it's like, all right, guys, that's yeah. what you want. Yeah, that's, that's very true. Business as usual. And I was like, she spent the whole book sort of in this, this like, feeling of, at one point they talk about depression, like, how Elizabeth was like, she's in a depression. Yeah, and they used that word several times in the book. It was noticeable to me. Yeah, Notable. and I thought, like... 
this is a book from the 80s and now depression is seen as like like a chemical imbalance and it's like like you, like mood swings of a teenager are not necessarily depressed. I mean, maybe sometimes they yeah. are, but like it was very much like she shows some upset at her family and feelings of woe is me and the family's like, oh, she must be depressed. Well, there's a line early in the book where Jessica, upset with her family the first time around, leaves to go meet up with her friend Kara and Kara's like, what's wrong, Jess? And Jess says nothing. Kara says, come on, Jess. For the last hour, a little neon sign over your head has been flashing depression, depression. <laughs> Kara made little pulsing motions with her hands. Yeah, that's. I think that's what I remember. I was and, like, I mean, right. yeah, and Jessica goes on to think like, well, what's she going to say to Kara? Well, Kara, I'm depressed because I'm not as good a person as Liz. <laughs> Which I... I'm depressed because X is actually... I, that's also kind of not the way we talk about depression anymore. Oh, you yeah. You know what I right. mean? Yep. It's not like... It's easy to think that way internally. Like, oh, I'm depressed because I lost my job. And certainly those things can, like, kick you into that place. But I don't think that we would necessarily think about yeah. it being a cause and effect when we start talking about, like, the chemicals that keep you in a depression. Right, Yeah. Well, I think it might be fair to say that Jessica's, though, going through something major through the course of this book. She really res- she really retreats from her family. And we could do this a bunch of different ways. But since I have the the singer of our of our stinger uh, for the section here with me, why don't we like kick a little early into the section of the podcast where we talk about boys? OK. Oh, oh who's a beautiful boy? Who's a beautiful boy? that I say that is because the whole like middle of this book uh, there is a boy in particular that factors very heavily which is the boy Nikki Shepard. Yes, Nikki um, is like the like the the devil may care bad boy. Yeah. Like dangerous, does some drugs maybe. Maybe. Well, actually <laughs> later on in the there's when he gets the opportunity to do some to smoke marijuana at a party, he turns it down. But he is drunk at that time, so yeah. <laughs> maybe he doesn't want to be cross-faded. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he definitely had he had several beers. And I then he drove like. really fast, drunk. But anyway, we're jumping the gun. Nikki Shepard, um, allow me to describe Nikki uh, the way he's first described in the book. We could talk a lot, and maybe we will talk a lot about Nikki, but Nikki was wild, that was for sure. He spent a lot of time with the crowd from the Shady Lady and drove a fast car. There were also rumors about drugs. But there was something about him that fascinated Jessica. He was very good looking in a rugged way. He wore his blonde hair a little long and he had pale blue eyes. His eyes were his most unusual feature. They were soft and sensitive looking in sharp contrast to the rest of his face. Other than his physical appearance, Jessica knew little about Nicky Shepard. He was quiet most of the time. And his image at Sweet Valley High was that of a loner, cool and distant. He didn't play any sports, although he had the body of a football player. I thought that was really <laughs> So, yeah. He's sexy as hell, and nobody knows anything about him, and he's a loner. And he's, a, like, a little bit of a forceful fellow, <laughs> initially. A little bit, yeah. Only in the first interaction. Then he really, like pulls way back but he's like I know you want to talk with me like I know you want me to stay here and talk to you and they're like go away we don't like you and he's like you want me to stay here yeah if you want me to stay here tell me to sit down or if you want me to leave tell me to sit down like he does weird mind games with them yeah 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 and then the first time (laughs) that doesn't make any sense out of context it only makes a little more sense in the context of the book (laughs) I and I was like immediately it's funny reading this book I I remembered it in a certain way and then I almost took issue, at least in the beginning, with everything. Like, oh, I was like, well, that's kind of shady. That's kind of shallow. That's kind of... But when he comes, like, he comes to the table and he is sort of, like, Mr. Cool and and trying to flirt with her. And then by the time they get to the party and then he, like, like, 
he does something and she says no and then he says I think maybe like I don't know what he does like to kiss or something but but definitely his personality in this first interaction is very much like he's he's like she keeps on telling him no go away we don't like you yeah but the way so when he first kisses oh, her right. when he yeah, first yeah. kisses her is also super weird because Jessica's all in a mood this is at Kara's party yeah he, she walks off to a bathhouse is what it's described as that's I guess like back behind wherever the party is I thought of it was like a pool house. Yeah, okay. And it's but like yeah, the house lights are like... off and Jessica doesn't turn the lights on <laughs> because she doesn't want to draw attention because she just wants to be alone, which is very on Jessica. Uh. And then it's like she hears a voice and Nikki is just in there by himself oh, in the yeah. dark. But then they have a whole conversation, and then the kiss is pre- prefaced by, close your eyes. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, ha- I want to show you something. Something like that. Yeah, I remember that. And she doesn't mind the kiss, but it is that's not the same thing as consent, boys. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. Maybe it was the, yeah, it must have been at the table where she's like, no, I don't want you here. And he's like, yeah, you do. Yeah, it's it's a little yeah. bit upsetting, especially reading it in 2019. Oh, yeah. It's but but there's nothing physical at that point. Yeah, yeah. Although maybe he puts his hand on hers. I think mm. he might like put his hand on her hand, and okay. she pulls it away. That's I think that happens. Yeah, it was very much like the bad boy, and she's like, "No, I don't want you." But and but she her descriptions of him is like, "Oh, but he's so cool and mysterious." Yeah, and she she like she sees that he's sensitive. Like she can tell by looking at him that he's a sensitive soul. Well, we could talk about Nikki forever, but we need to talk about how he figures into the plot cuz it's in a major way. Oh yeah. Um he's got like bad shit going on with his parents. It's weird bad shit, but Yeah, I mean, it sounds like his his dad like it just works a lot. Yeah, and like his parents just don't pay a lot of attention to him. So he feels the same way that Jessica feels except his is kind of legit. Like his parents are not paying attention to him. And so that's part of why they bond, because he mm. opens up and tells her how, like, well, my my parents don't uh, think, don't really need, they don't pay much attention to me, I'm just a problem for them, and mm. it'd be easier for them if I weren't around. And Jessica, like, hears herself in that a little bit, and I think it actually kind of amplifies her own problems. Yeah. Because she relates to him when maybe she shouldn't. Yeah, he's he, he. The way they describe his family dynamic, he has a brother, right? That has yeah, has asthma. Yeah, asthma. They make it medical. like they say it's asthma, but it makes they make it seem like it's really takes a lot of time. Yeah, and it's like the mother is doing that all the time. Yeah, and then the dad is working, and it seems like Nikki just um, just feels a little bit unloved and feels a little bit like disposable in his yeah. family. And so he does things that maybe get him in trouble. It seems like he's gotten in trouble a bit, probably just for attention. Yeah, Um, and he seems like he's maybe a little bit, like, wiser than his years in some ways. Like, he's, you know, kind of sees right through Jessica, but also thinks, like, is, I don't know, kind of interested in her. Which yeah. I don't know what that says about him, but they, they, they have a bond. They have a genuine yeah, bond. Yeah. And then he has this friend who has some kind of a business in San Francisco, mm. which they never say what it is. And so basically he tells Jessica that his plan is to head out and, like, leave town and go live in San Francisco. And Jessica's, like, aghast at the idea of someone quitting high school. Yeah. She says that she's never heard of that, except that's not true. There are other characters in these books before that have dropped out of high school, I think. But Oh, and she goes to that party with him. Yeah. And she meets somebody that also dropped out of yeah, school. Yeah, someone named June, who she really likes and like relates to, which I thought was interesting. That first, that we are des- it is described to us that Jessica is like, here's one person who's also not really drinking. Mm, yeah. um, Jessica doesn't want to drink beer with strangers, it seems yeah. like. And... Does she drink, because this was a party, after going to parties that um, were of her friends, that she met Nikki at that party where he kissed her. Yeah. Then Nikki took her to hit one of his friends' parties. Yeah, it was like out in a faraway neighborhood. Like an hour away. I think it was called Tierra Verde, is what I think this neighborhood was called. (laughs) Yeah, like an hour away, and she felt really... Pomona. Yeah, (laughs) Pomona, Claremont, yeah. Yeah. Um, She... Feels, yeah, really out of place. But, yeah, she would totally drink beer at her friend's party. Like, oh, she would really? drink. I think so. The, oh. the book describes it like her the parties she goes to don't usually have beer. But okay. we've seen Jessica at a few parties that have had liquor or, like, wine or something. But I think it is different because she doesn't know people here. And she thinks she's still not totally sure about Nikki and his 
friends, his like element. There's a lot of talk about like people's scenes, like what's like high school is oh, yeah. not my scene. Oh like, yeah, this isn't really your scene. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I I remember those. Yeah, and so, but yeah, the first it sets up that Jessica like kind of relates to this girl June, and then we find out that June also dropped out of high school to become a waitress. It's like, oh, Jessica's like, oh, okay, you know, I could see how this could be. But Jessica's like, what Nikki asks Jessica, basically, like, you could come to San Francisco with me. Like, we could both be there together, away from our terrible families. Mm-hmm. And Jessica's like, she thinks about it and is like, no, I never could leave my family. But when she starts thinking about it, again, everything her family does or says makes her feel like they don't like her. And she is just, like, a problem for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she keeps saying shit like that. Like, when they try to apologize to her. But um, there's also this big scene where she's decided that she's going to have a serious talk with every member oh, of her family. yeah. Yep. And, like, one by one, they all don't stop and talk to her. Yeah, they're all... I, I think it's the case again, right? They're yeah. all, like, busy with the case. I think the brother is going to play tennis or something. Yeah, he wants um, to go for a jog. Yeah. And... She's like, Stephen, we need to talk. Or can we, can I talk to you? And he's like, Can it wait? I gotta go for. I really want to take this jog. I gotta play tennis later. <laughs> right. And but, like, I keep trying to remember that like Stephen is like what eighteen, nineteen. Mm-hmm. So I had a brother. Like he didn't want to talk to me either. We didn't have like serious conversation. Maybe their family is different, but like, yeah, I can, like. I can see that. It's all honestly, like, it's all, no, nobody does anything egregious. It's just that it would behoove them to, like, realize that this is a weird thing for Jessica to be doing and, like, pause. But then Elizabeth, mm. she actually does pause and say, oh, sure, if you want to talk, we can talk. But she glances at her watch and Jessica thinks, oh, Liz, if only you hadn't done that. If only you hadn't looked at your watch. This would have worked out, but you looked at your watch. Then Elizabeth says, do you remember? She yeah, said... I won't even go. Yeah, if this yeah. is important, I'll stay home all day. Yeah, like, what a nice sister. This is she's, This is like the most important thing. She's, like, writing an article for the newspaper about it. She, <laughs> but, but Jessica is already like, no, I, she doesn't have time for me. And then yep. she writes this letter. She's decided. She's running away. Yep. She sits down and writes this letter. Should I read the letter? Yeah, sure. She decides that she's just going to write to Liz. And she also has these thoughts about how, like, she definitely wants to make them feel bad. Yeah. And like, she, only a little bad, but... She wasn't going to write a letter because... Yeah, she, remember, she wasn't going to write a letter, yeah. but if she didn't, she thought maybe they uh, would think she'd been kidnapped. <laughs> like Elizabeth was. <laughs> oh. <laughs> she has, well. a, like, a legitimate reason to think about that. <laughs> so, Jessica writes, Dear Liz, by the time you get this, I will be far away... I'm sorry if my leaving causes you all a lot of pain, but it will be better for all of us in the long run. There are many reasons why I'm going. It isn't just your fault. You can't help being the way you are any more than I can. You're so good. It would just be better for all of you if you'd forget that I ever even existed. I've never been anything but trouble anyway. This doesn't mean I'm forgetting about you. I'll be thinking a lot about all of you as I take the bus to my new home. I love you, Liz, and make sure you tell Mom and Dad that I love them, too, and Steve, even though I know he hates me. (laughs) Someday I'll return, I promise, but not for a long time. Please don't try to find me. My mind is made up. I'm sorry for all the trouble I've caused. Still your loving sister, Jessica. And then she does have the greatest P.S. of all time, which is, P.S., I'm leaving you my new jeans. I think they make me look fat anyway. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. I want to sign all my letters like that now. Like, thanks for the uh, birthday present. Love you, Marissa. P.S. I'm leaving you my new jeans. (laughs) I think they made me look fat anyway. There were a couple. There was one. They were at the restaurant. I think it was Jessica and um, her friend Kara, maybe? Yeah. They were at some restaurant, and Kara had to order fries, and she's like, Harry, you can have some of my fries. I'm supposed to be on a diet anyways. And I'm like... Who's putting you on? <laughs> yeah. They're both cheerleaders. They're both drinking tab, which I thought was funny. They're both tab? tab which is like Diet Cola. Oh, yeah. From the 80s. Yeah. That's um, and the one thing that I thought was interesting was that the book describes Jessica as actually being self-aware 
that she doesn't really want to run away. Mm. She's writing the letter and leaving it for them so that they'll see it and they'll come catch her. Because she, what she wants is for them to, like, show that they love her yeah. by stopping her. Yep. And I don't think it's surprising that she feels that way, but I was a little surprised that the book allowed her to be aware of it. Mm, okay. But then when she closes the door, the, what she doesn't see is that the letter blows behind the dresser. So they come home from the trial, which, oh my God, we have to talk about <laughs> Elizabeth and Ricky. <laughs> that was interesting. Um, so, yeah, I mean, pause, because in the book, the plot of the book... Ricky has been kind of understandably, like, standoffish about the whole trial to Elizabeth. A little bit of a jerk. Mm. But Elizabeth, like, goes to talk to him because the judge is kind of like, it's out, this is out of my hands, unfortunately. I feel for these grandparents. But the law says if nobody in the family, you know, not just the parents, but also the children, nobody wants to see these grandparents, then, uh, then I, there's nothing I can do. But, like, Elizabeth knows, I guess, from Annie Whitman, is that how you read it, that, that Ricky does love his grandparents, but he's, like, taking out, he's mad at his dad for leaving, and so he's taking out. Yeah. This, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Which is all reasonable teenager stuff, right? Absolutely, and yeah. But Jessica, I'm sorry, Elizabeth, like, hands him his ass. Like, she follows him out, and he's like, he's like, butt out. Like, I just want everybody to leave me alone. I want my grandparents to leave me alone. I want you to leave me alone. And Jessica, like, or I keep saying Jessica because it's actually kind of a Jessica thing, but Elizabeth, like, can't suppress her anger. Yeah. She, like, lays into him. Yeah. She talked about, like, him punishing his grandparents and all they wanted to do was love him. And it was very quick, his turnaround. So they, he goes back in, he sits down, and then he's like, if it's not too late to speak, like. Yeah. And so then, she's fucking saves the day just like yep. just like Jessica said that she would and like she always does but the way that, it's just so bizarre to me that the way she saves the day is she just like yells at him like she's like like she tells him that she thought he was strong because of the way he helped Annie and he's like she's like I never thought I'd see you giving up like this and he says I'm not giving up anything don't give me that. You're mad at your father and you want to get back at him, so this is how you're doing it. By hurting your grandparents, who never did anything to you other than love you. Well, if that's how you feel, then you're doing the right thing by turning away from your grandparents. Because you don't deserve that love, Ricky. Go ahead, give up. Just put it out of your mind and get more and more bitter. That's really smart. <laughs> it's very, very intense. I was just like, whoa, Liz, somebody's upset. Like, talk about journalistic integrity. She's maybe uh, tampering a little bit here in her (laughs) own story. (laughs) Exactly. Oh, that's funny. Oh, gosh. Yeah. So it gets back to Jessica. She leaves and gets on the bus, but the family doesn't know that she's run away because they haven't read the letter. Yeah, I thought the story would go in, or could go in a bunch of different directions. I was like, well, maybe they won't end up calling her friend. They'll just assume that she's at her friend's house, and, like, she'll go, and then they won't show up, and then she'll just come back home. I was like, that could where this be where the story's coming, uh, going. They don't find the letter, but doesn't Elizabeth find, go into her room and it's clean? And that was the big shock. Like, oh, why is, and all her clothes are gone or something. Yeah, and the fact that her room is clean is, like the big signal that, like, something serious is going on. Then they really spring into action. And it's actually really special that even without the letter, the family figures out... Absolutely, ...that she, yeah. like, they 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 really go, like, all Sherlock, you know? They, they have to call various people. They go to Nikki's house. Yeah, they, like, hunt them. I think they look like in, like, the phone book, which also tells you it's, yeah. it's in, the, in the 80s or 90s or something. So they go to the shepherd's house. Mm-hmm. They find out only after some effort that they don't know where Nikki is because he ran away. Right. And the mom's there, but she seems sort of, like, not willing to help them. Yeah. And then she, I think she kind of just, like, realizes that she's going to look like a shitty mom <laughs> because they haven't looked for him. Yeah. But, I mean, she's like, he's troubled. I mean, you... Parents uh, of troubled kids, I mean, it's like, I can kind of understand. Yeah. But if 
they obviously, I mean, they're bad parents. I don't want to, like, let them off the hook. They seem like they're bad. Well, but, they seem like they're just, they got a lot on their plate with yeah. the son and with whatever the dad's issues are with. Because they talk about, I think Nikki talks, talks about the American dream. He yeah, describes his he dad like as. used to be poor or something, and then he's worked really hard to maybe give him this life. But in the meantime, he doesn't pay any attention to yeah. his kids because he's so hard. Make, he's working so hard to make money, and so that's causing all these other problems with his kids. So he doesn't seem like a terrible person. He just seems like like he's doing the best he can, and that's like yeah. making money. I but, guess. Yeah, it's like a mutual thing because the parents, I think that they would be trying harder if they realized how Nikki really felt. But mm-hmm. Nikki has come up with his own idea about what his his parents' perspective is. And so he's not trying to show his true self to them. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, and like it seems like his the references in the story about him are that he sort of does things that are sort of bad. Because they go to that party mm-hmm. and then he's drunk and he drives home, and he... He, like, like, runs the car really fast or uncursed. Jessica is, like, doesn't think he should be driving, but she can tell that she's, like, hurt his feelings by oh, asking him. To drive. Yeah, she asks him, but then she doesn't press it because his feelings are hurt. Yes. Precious male ego. She's she's like, okay, and then he's driving super fast, and he's, like, almost missing cars, and they're moving out of the way. Mm-hmm. If luckily, they don't hit another car, but he does, like, hit a telephone pole. Mm-hmm. And, like, the damage isn't that bad, but they have to call his parents to drive them home. The other car doesn't even stop. Yeah, that was interesting. Um, and I thought it was weird that after seeing what Nikki's relationship with his parents was really like, that Jessica didn't go home and be like, oh, actually, my problems are nothing. <laughs> yeah, I think... Like, in that moment, uh, it seemed like she was just really being sympathetic of Nikki and he, that he felt bad. But his parents were like, you always, this is the last straw. You always do things like this. And we're having to forever bail you out. And and she was just feeling like, oh, he's really sorry. Or Yeah. And he says, I'll be out of your hair soon. Mm, yeah. like, and his dad's like, good. Like, yeah. you, if you, maybe if you get out on your own, you can you know, man up a little bit or something. I don't know. Uh, But anyway, they, so they had, they need to find out where Nikki went. And then Steven like calls a friend and like does a trick where he like pretends that he has money for Nikki to like trick the friend into revealing where Nikki's gone. Because the friend's (laughs) like, oh, well, you know what? Nikki really needs that hundred bucks or whatever. So I'll tell you where he is. He's in San Francisco with Denny. Andrews or whatever the guy's name is. So then they like race to the bus station. Yeah, they split up. Like he's got it. She's got to either be on an airplane or a bus. Yeah, and I couldn't tell. So so I was like, all right, are the parents going to fly to San Francisco? They were going to the airport. I was like, I was like, all right, like. That story ne- went nowhere. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know if they got to the airport, if they, you know, yeah. looked for her name or whatever. But I thought that was really interesting. And they, like, get to the... It's very, actually very dramatic. Like, they, like, tense. They get to the bus station. So this is Stephen and Steve- mm-hmm. uh, Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Yeah. Right before... Like, right as the bus has pulled away, mm-hmm. it gets a head start. So they drive to the next bus stop, which they also catch, like... The bus starts to pull away. They would keep falling it all the way to San Francisco, except Stephen's almost out of gas. So if they don't catch her at the next stop, they'll really be far behind. And But then the bus has to stop because some old lady has left her <laughs> so, radiator on or something. Yeah. So the, the beginning of that chapter was like super funny to me. Um, you know which one I'm talking about? The, uh, the chapter where the old lady is leaning on Jessica's. Yeah. Oh, it made me think of Adventures in Babysitting. Did you ever see Adventures in Babysitting? Uh, I the movie? Yeah. Yeah. So in that movie, the whole adventure is to go, like, rescue Elizabeth Shue's friend, who has also kind of, like, decided that she's going to run away, and she's at the bus station, and she has second thoughts, because she is, like, the people here are crazy, like, I don't want to run away, like, I don't want to be like these people, but, like, come rescue me from these weirdos. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah. I think that's what happened. I haven't seen the movie in a long yeah, time, it's been a long but time I have time. seen it many times. But yeah, I thought the beginning of that um, that chapter was like very interesting. It sort of it definitely set up like a scene 
Uh, and the other thing about that that I thought was weird is like, if your boyfriend asked you to go to San Francisco with him, like, why isn't he with her? Like, why? Yeah, he goes ahead. Like, a yeah, day like before. that's very odd to me that you're asking this girl to go with you to San Francisco to leave her parents, and then you're gonna be like, yeah, I'll meet you in San Francisco, and you just get there on your own. I thought yeah. that was sort of shitty. Yeah, it's just like it had to be that way for the plot to work. Absolutely. <laughs> the same way that it had to be that this old lady is the one who's like, stop the bus. If you don't stop, my house will go on fire. Yeah, I have to like, call the neighbor. She left something on, like yeah. a humidifier or something. Yeah, I, I think was, that's right. Yeah, I was like, um, okay. But then it's so, I actually like got a little bit teary eyed reading about the reunion when Elizabeth and Wake, and Elizabeth and Stephen Wakefield like run up and. Elizabeth gets on the bus, and Jessica's like, it couldn't be, but it was. It was Elizabeth's voice telling Aww. her, like, oh, we love you, come back. And uh-huh. So, and then the bus driver has some jokes where he's like, uh, you don't have to stay on the bus, but I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry. I did the accent, but not the... <laughs> Yeah, and they asked for content. a suitcase, and he's like, let's just have a picnic here. Because yeah, that's what it is. And he's like, look, you know, this bus is leaving, but if you guys are going to stay on it, you got to pay for tickets. That's what he says. Yeah. And then they have a happy reunion. So, yeah, and yeah. they work everything out, and it's a nice little quick wrap-up yeah. to all the issues that that she had been having for the yeah. first and everything's all happy for everybody except for poor Nikki, who's oh, yeah. in San Francisco. And you never hear from mm-hmm. him again. She writes this letter to him. Yeah. I won't be joining you. I'm yeah. sorry, but it's just not the right thing for me. And then she goes home and, like, offers to embezzle money from her parents. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing I was sort of stuck out to me is you know when they're when elizabeth and steven are um trying to find the bus station they're like we don't know where it is and we're not sure like uh how to how to i think how to get there or something and i was like wow times have really changed like like nowadays you have everything on your phone you don't have to know where anything is yeah it's really a reminder of and also when she calls from a landline you know when she calls nikki at the in the middle of the book, and she's like, hi, is Nikki there? And she's, like, on a landline. <laughs> yeah, and Nikki's brother has to go get him. Yep. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that just, like, doesn't happen too much anymore, mm-hmm. except for maybe, like, in an office with an assistant. Yeah. I never even thought about, like, do kids now call the parent's cell phone and say, hey, or do they just text, or do I they never message? thought about that. If your parents don't have a landline, but you're maybe, like, you know, 12, you don't have a cell phone. Yeah. Yeah. Whoa. I mean, most of my, most of the kids I know that are, by the time they're like 11 or 12, they have cell phones. But still, I remember calling parents' houses at like 8 or 9 or 10, you know? Yeah, sure. Is so-and-so there? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. (laughs) I guess so. Listeners, write in. If you're 12, (laughs) tell me how you communicate with your friends. How are you listening to this podcast right now? Seriously. Does everybody you know have a smartphone? (laughs) Do you have an iTunes account? Yeah. A beautiful boy is a beautiful boy is a beautiful boy. Well, Jocelyn, I thank you very much for reading this book. And, of course, I thank you uh, this week, as every week, for the use of your song, Beautiful Boy. Oh, you are so welcome. But I have to ask you an important question, which is, are you a Jessica or an Elizabeth? I think that growing, or when I read these books, I was a Jessica, because I thought she was cooler. But now that I'm a full-grown adult, I um, I think if if... I had to pick one. I'd say Elizabeth is going to have the the steady future. <laughs> She's going to be a contribution to society. Yeah. And I probably am on the Elizabeth camp. Even though she does come off as a super goody-goody in this yeah. book, and she has the weird outburst with Ricky, she does actually show a lot more sensitivity than, like, almost anyone else in the book, including Jessica, despite my intro saying that Jessica was the most sympathetic <laughs> character. But I did feel for Jessica, and that's saying something, because normally I do not feel for Jessica yeah. very much. And probably out of the two of them, Jessica is probably more like a teenager, you know? She's very yeah. much like it's about her, and her life's about, you know, everything 
is because of her and her reactions to her family are very like you know teenagery they're very self-centered whereas elizabeth seems a little bit older in general more yeah. sensitive more caring neither of them is terribly realistic as a teenager but jessica is more like a teenager for oh, sure yeah. i think at the end of the book they are back at school and oh, yeah. uh, there's some new drama going on would you care to tease us for book yeah. number 22 yeah so they wrap it up really nicely the family all seems to get along they make some jokes about Jessica's it's status cooking. quo, really, you know, <laughs> nothing's changed. And then the last couple of pages are like drama, and it's about Dee Dee and Bill. And it asks, What's happening to Dee Dee and Bill's perfect relationship? Find out in Sweet Valley High, number 22. Too much in love, available in August. In August, you guys. You won't <laughs> have to wait till August to listen to the episode, though. Yeah, you can read it right now. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jocelyn, for being here. Thanks again. Listeners, I really want to thank you for waiting out the hiatus. Uh, I produced this show myself, uh, and because I don't have a co-host, there's a lot of work that goes into the whole, like, scheduling guests and finding people who are willing to join me on this, and it's a lot of fun, but I don't uh, get paid for it, so (laughs) I need to uh, take a break every once in a while, and then... uh, part of that break is also spent like planning the next season so um i'm really really thrilled to be back not going anywhere if you want to follow uh, me on instagram follow along with the podcast that's really my favorite place to to kind of interact and post pictures and stuff uh turn this audio medium into something a little more visual on instagram it's sweet valley diaries i'm on twitter at sweet valley send me an email about you know just like anything i love to hear listener stories about you know what sweet valley experiences they had when they were a kid or coming back to it you can email me at sweet valley diaries at me.com because i've been at this for a long time and uh sweet valley diaries.net which is the long-standing blog that uh this podcast started as a blog in 2006 i think you could say uh it started as an iweb site which is um a software that uh, does not exist anymore so back in the uh the mobile me days. Anyway, that's enough lore. That's some of the some of the Sweet Valley lore. Um, so thanks so much for listening, and uh, see you next time. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>Like whatever we were drinking all over the floor, it would be maybe the seventh time that that's happened during oh, really? the recording. So uh, it happens.